Hello, I am Dr. Esther Peters, and today with my colleague, Jen, Jennifer Salerno from George Mason University, we're going to be talking about the topic of the relevance of histology in the pathological investigation of coral disease. This has been the story of my life. Until about 1970, coral reefs were considered pristine, all of their organisms thriving. When I began my master's research, um, Phil Dustin, who is giving our second plenary talk today, was documenting the extensive Elkhorn coral thickets at Kerry's Fort Reef in the Florida Keys. I studied the effects of number two fuel oil on corals as drilling and shipping oil were becoming concerns. Then for my dissertation research, I switched to study the effects of sedimentation and the second reported disease of corals, white band disease. When I got my PhD, Phil was discovering that more corals on Cary's Fort Reef were dying from this and other diseases, as you can see in this 1985 frame uh, on this slide. And unfortunately, reefs all around the tropical Western Atlantic were too. Only more recently have we realized that their demise occurred during a period of increasing seawater temperatures and decreasing seawater pH, among other factors. We have now seen 50 years of continuing disease outbreaks, leading to numerous colony mortalities, loss of skeletal accretion that provides habitat for reef organisms and shoreline protection, loss of reproduction and larval settlement to renew the coral population, and ultimately, we have food web destruction. From the first reports of black band and white band diseases, um, we now have seen a variety of disease outbreaks, including coral bleaching, black band disease, white plague, white pox, yellow band disease, and dark spots disease, most of which have also been recognized to occur globally. In 2014, uh, we had more than half of the species present on reefs of Southeast Florida start to lose tissue. Um, and this outbreak spread north um, along the coast and then south down to the dry tortugas and has also affected corals distant uh, in the Caribbean, uh, Jamaica, Mexico, Dominican Republic, Turks and Caicos, Puerto Rico, British Virgin Islands, the Bahamas, Belize, St. Martin, and St. Eustatius. And yet, although a few pathogenic microorganisms, bacteria, have been identified and shown to be causing some of these diseases, we still have many questions about what is causing them. To obtain a disease diagnosis requires recognizing the earliest stages of the disease, what the lesions look like, uh, what abnormalities and tricks tissue structure might be associated with changing behavior and loss of normal metabolic function. We also need to investigate the situation and the victim because we now know that both biotic and abiotic factors, usually a combination of anthropogenic and chronic exposures, can cause morbidities and mortalities. Infectious viruses and bacteria as well as chemical contaminants and suspended particulate matter are all pathogens. The situation in the ocean can, can change rapidly with the next tide or storm, but often the collection of observations and then samples have been delayed as agencies figure out who can do the analyses and issue permits for coral sample collection. With delays, unfortunately, information can be lost and the coral agent disappears, a causal agent disappears, compromising the diagnosis. I started to study coral diseases using the same methods that anatomic pathologists in hospitals use, fixing a sample in a formaldehyde-based solution to preserve uh, the cellular structures, embedding the calcified tissue and paraffin, then cutting off thin sections, mounting them on microscope slides, and staining them. By studying the sections with a light microscope, we can learn about their condition and take photomicrographs for analysis. Tissue changes that affect vital functions can be present well before they are visually evident, and thus, an apparently healthy coral may not be in good condition microscopically. The scene is the images on the left and right sides of the slide. Uh, corals can have various cellular changes, bacteria, fungi, 
uh, protozoa um, or uh, other things that alter their cells and tissues despite being visually normal when collected. In the middle images, uh, these samples came from bleached corals. While many people would um, say that the corals had expelled the symbiotic algae or zooxanthellae, histology revealed there were two different mechanisms of bleaching, uh, one in which zooxanthellae were retained and the other with one in which the gastrodermis was sloughed off. Uh, and so uh, there can be additionally more changes occurring. After bacteria were identified in the earliest recognized coral diseases, more microbiologists joined the investigation. Uh, this incomplete synopsis shows a number of studies reporting bacteria associated with or causing coral diseases, as was confirmed by following Koch's postulate. The first investigations were limited to culturing bacteria from ground tissue skeletal samples or from mucus that was collected with syringes or spots. However, most bacteria cannot be cultured. Um, and while the incorporation of molecular methods has somewhat helped us to circumvent this issue, it has also shifted our understanding of disease processes in diverse organisms and our reliance on Koch's postulate. So one of the major barriers complicating our ability to determine coral disease etiologies is our inability to fulfill Koch's postulates. Are there criteria that have traditionally been used over the past 130 years to establish a causative relationship between a microorganism and a disease? As a reminder, these postulates stipulate that a suspect microorganism must be present in all cases of disease and not in healthy individuals, must be isolated in pure culture from diseased organisms, and then cause disease when introduced into a new susceptible host. Finally, it must be isolated from the inoculated host and identical to the original isolate. However, there are major pitfalls with this approach that have prevented us from making progress with determining disease ideologies. First of all, the majority of microorganisms have not been cultured, preventing the fulfillment of the second postulate. And furthermore, with our extended exploration of host-associated microbiomes using molecular techniques and our resulting increased understanding of their roles in health and disease, the traditional Koch's postulates, which state that one pathogen leads to one disease, are no longer valid. For example, polymicrobial diseases, or diseases caused by more than a single type or species of pathogen, for example, black band disease in corals, as well as dysbiotic diseases, or those resulting from a shift in microbial composition or function, resulting in an atypical host response, do not fulfill Koch's postulates. Therefore, a more complete and complex interpretation of Koch's postulates has been called for to better understand and explain these diseases. In the late 1980s, the postulates were modified as molecular Koch's postulates to focus more on identifying a gene that may cause a microorganism to be pathogenic and lead to disease, rather than relying on the ability to isolate a particular pathogen itself. This approach helps to explain infections caused by intracellular pathogens that can't be cultured outside the host, but also pathogenic strains of otherwise benign microorganisms. This was a good start, however, there are still limitations, including that some genes cannot be manipulated and some diseases do not have suitable animal models. In 1996, Fredericks and Roman expanded molecular Koch's postulates to include sequence-based taxonomic identification of microbial pathogens. And more recently, ecological Koch's postulates have been proposed, which look at the disease process from a whole ecosystem perspective to include associated microbiota, the genetic makeup of the host, nutrition, age, as well as abiotic factors and environmental stressors, which form an entity that could possibly lead to disease. These postulates focus on identification of dysbiotic microbiota, their retrieval and introduction to a new susceptible host, and monitoring the stability of these microbiota over time. These modifications are more in line with our current understanding of the role of microbiomes in host health and disease, as well as the molecular methodology increasingly being used to study them. And over the past several decades, we've observed a rapid increase in molecular-based microbiome studies as a result of advancing sequencing technology and decreasing cost. And of course, the same trend has been observed in the subfield of coral microbiology, with the increase of 16S ribosomal RNA gene-based coral microbiome studies over time as shown here. And these studies have yielded an abundance of important information that has significantly advanced our understanding of coral microbiomes. 
For example, we have a better understanding of the types of microbes associated with corals under non-disease conditions and their potential functional roles with respect to the coral host. We're also able to use these molecular methods to monitor dysbiotic and functional shifts in associated microbiomes in response to stressors, inching us closer to unraveling coral disease processes. However, there are still notable limitations, and despite the increase in molecular-based studies, we still have some pretty significant knowledge gaps to address. Some specific limitations of using molecular methods alone to investigate coral disease include the following. We lose the spatial organization of microorganisms to the host tissue cells at a scale that's relevant to both, and we cannot directly observe microposts interactions. And while we are improving in this regard with programs like the Earth Microbiome Project, there's still a lack of standardized methodology being implemented. For example, we know that using D different DNA extraction protocols and PCR primers can impact microbiome detection and downstream analyses. And despite the growing body of research, we still have not determined the etiologies for the majority of coral diseases. So what are we missing? Well, it's important to acknowledge that increased culturing efforts are greatly needed. There's no doubt about that. But also what has been shown conclusively during the 50 years of studying coral diseases is that using only molecular or only histological methods are not capable of showing where in the coral host particular viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms are present, or whether or not they're actually causing pathological changes in the tissues. Today, we're emphasizing that combining disciplinary methods can address many of these data gaps. Kudos to those scientists who are already employing these methods in their work. Here, we are calling for the increased practice of integrating histology and molecular methods in coral disease studies. And this is no means uh, all-inclusive, but in the next few slides, I'll highlight a couple examples of combining molecular and histological methods for studying coral disease. So here is an example of immunohistochemistry. In this technique, a specific molecule of interest can be injected into a mammal whose adaptive immune system, B cells, will then secrete antibodies to the molecule or antigen that can be harvested. The location of that molecule in any tissue sample can then be found when the antibody is applied and binds to it. A fluorescent or colored molecule then labels the antibody so it can be seen using microscopy. So in this light micrograph here, you can see nuclei of cells dying by programmed cell death or apoptosis. And they stain brown when DNA is fragmented, resulting in damage to nuclei and cell death. These preliminary results are by graduate student Elizabeth McDonald and suggest that the liquefactive necrosis lesions found in stony coral tissue loss disease are related to an increase in apoptosis. In this next slide, you can see an example of in situ hybridization, in which a single stranded nucleotide sequence is prepared and a probe labeled with either a colored or fluorescent molecule in which binds to its complementary sequence if present in the cells or tissues. Here, the universal U bacterial probe, is binding, which binds to most bacterial phylotypes, is binding to what we suspect to be bacteria from previous scheme sustaining of a tissue section. And this was another project, uh, or project that another graduate student, Samantha Cook, worked on. Correlative light and electron microscopy is yet another method by which molecular and histological data can be integrated. On the left, a transmission electron micrograph of deep sea mussel gill bacterial symbionts is overlaid with a fish or fluorescent in situ hybridization micrograph labeled with a methanotroph specific probe, mapping specifically where these endosymbionts are found within the host gill tissue. On the right is a parallel coral specific example. Here, granules and polyp coleoblasts of massive starlet coral Cedastria sidaria stain pink with eosin or gimsa, which indicates that they contain proteins and were considered to be the coral acid-rich proteins or CARPs attributed to forming aragonite crystals in corals. Upon inspection with fluorescent in situ hybridization, we were surprised to see that the bacterial probe bound to these granules. And transmission electron microscopy further revealed that they in fact look similar in ultrastructure to primitive bacteria chlamydia. Finally, laser capture microdissection paired with microscopy can be used to remove cells from specific locations in tissue sections mounted on slides. The area to be isolated is selected and then a laser is used to activate a film on a plastic cap to remove the selected cells. From there, the cells can be viewed to ensure capture and then processed for nucleic acid extraction or protein extraction. This method can be used for taxonomic identification of suspected pathogens as well as gene expression and protein studies. And as our laboratories endeavor to apply these methods to the study of coral disease, of course, we often come away with many questions. 
prompting us to reach out to others for advice and collaboration. So with that, we'd like to end with this slide, reiterating that transdisciplinary collaboration is critical. Because of the complexity of diseases in corals as well as other organisms, it's important to develop collaborations or mutualistic symbioses with other experts. Applying multiple techniques in field surveys and controlled laboratory experiments is essential to understanding the etiologies and pathogen pathogenesis. But no one person can undertake everything, and there's a niche for everyone in coral disease investigations. And with that, we'd like to thank you for your time. Well, thank you both. Jen on the left here and Esther on the right. And um, it's time now, and, and await your questions later on. For the moment, it's time for Dr. Phil Dustin of the College of Charleston in South Carolina to put up his slideshow. While I tell you that Phil has conducted research in Florida, as you saw from his slides earlier, uh, the Caribbean and the Indo-Pacific, most recently Indonesia, at scales that vary from the photobiology of Susan Thelly to the textural analysis of satellite remote images. And the title of his talk today is, Phil, where's your talk? Well, I'm, I'm looking, looking for at, it. I'm looking at Jen. I know, hang on. She's smiling. Can you guys see no, it? We see is you it now. We see you, but not your talk. Hmm. Hmm. How about now? Nope. 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 We see you with a beautiful yeah. reef in the background, and it's obviously yeah. Indo Pacific. Yeah. yeah. Zoom you do in lose the it. Tells me I should share. There you go. The coral what? reef tourism <laughs> pandemic. The floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. I'd like to really a big shout out here to uh, Francisca and Chelsea and Judy for setting this up. I think this is a great idea. Um, as the pandemic has come along, I've been involved in a couple of these and um, they're, getting, they're getting easier to do and they're actually getting more exciting. So welcome everybody. A uh, big shout out to UWI there, home of Discovery Bay <clears throat> and uh, Cindy Hunter in Hawaii and everybody else in between. What I wanna talk about today is something I've been thinking about for a while and, um, you know, we live on an absolutely spectacular planet. As a matter of fact, it's the only planet we know of that harbors life. And life generates what we have here as a biosphere. Can we think in terms then of um, our wonderful blue marble? And when we sit back and we begin to look at it, we realize that life is not just universally distributed all over the planet. We find hotspots of biodiversity or more different kinds of <clears throat> species living in the tropical belt. And this has been attributed to the idea that the tropics are areas of high species diversity because they're biologically controlled. They tend to be older, they tend to be benign, they tend to be more predictable, and they tend to be an environment in which evolution can generate more different kinds of forms. And actually the interactions of those different kinds of forms is what enables those different kinds of forms to evolve. These are biologically controlled communities. And of those, reefs are the oldest, they're the most productive, and the most diverse of these ecosystems that we know of. And they are distributed in the tropics, as we can see on the top map here from uh, Charlie Veron. We see the coral triangle in the very center, which is the heart of diversity. The uh, second map, which is reefs at risk by Loretta Burke and her groups at WRI, we can begin to see the idea that some of these risks, some of these reefs are at greater risk than others. And then the lower map, which was recently published by the Nature Conservancy in terms of the Atlas of Ocean Wealth, shows the dollar value, if you will, of um, coral reefs around the world. And right now it's somewhere around $36 billion a year. That's US dollars. And this, by the way, shows the distribution of humans on the planet. So, Humans have started expanding dramatically into this world. Um, around 1750, around the time of the, the forming of this country here, where we are in, in America, you know, we had about a billion people on the planet. Now we're up to about seven. And the greatest rate of change has taken place from about 1950 to present. And the time period that I'm gonna be talking about is between approximately um, 1970 and present day. 
So we've gone from about 4 billion people up to about 7 billion. <clears throat> and during that time, we have seen an increase in coral monitoring projects. And at the same time, we've seen a decrease in coral cover. And you wonder if they're correlated or not. And the reefs that we started monitoring were big, large structures that were emerging properties of all the organisms that lived on them. And Carries Fort Reef, as Esther showed in the earlier photographs, now looks like this. It's basically a pile of rubble, and it's gone into what I would call um, sort of ecological ruin. In Valley Symphony Reef on the north side of Menjengan Island, um, one of the bucket list dives in the world. In Valley, this reef was absolutely beautiful in 2014. And by 2017, it was nothing but a bunch of shards. In Dancing Lady Reef on the north coast of Jamaica, Discovery Bay, where Modern coral reef biology got its beginning or one of its starts with Tom Goro's lab, the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, had this wonderful reef um, that was really a magical place to go diving on. And I went back in 2013 and it looks like this. So you begin to look at all these reefs and their change and it's like a war zone. And you really have to begin to ask yourself, um, is it time to imagine a world without coral reefs? We know that the stressors um, are global and regional and local. They're nested, they're simultaneous, they're synergistic, they're catastrophic in your result. The largest global stress that we know of that we're beginning, just really beginning to the rollout of is climate change from addition of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We've also added quite a bit of methyl chlorides and other molecules that change the composition of the atmosphere in many other ways, sort of promoting things like the ozone hole and um, acid rain and things like that. But anywhere you go on the planet, if you drop in the water and look at a reef, you can tell the symptoms of reef degradation. Their coral diseases, their excess algal growth, their sediments, crown of thorns in the Indo-Pacific, um, physical damages, and of course, bleaching. And the paradox of all of this is the, the real interesting sort of enigma of reefs for years was, how do you get the highest expression of life in the sea and it's thriving in waters that are devoid of nutrients and devoid of sediments, but they're really rich in energy. And life has figured out over the last three, four, 500 million years, how to harvest that sunlight and trap and retain nutrients. And what we see now are reefs have very intense herbivory, they have very high filtration rates. We think of the reef as a wall of mounds. And these have evolved in a very predictable climate the tropics, and we see symbiosis playing a very large role in this. You can think of a reef sort of as an economy, um, industrial flow path analysis, industrial ecology looks at the imports into the reef and the exports coming out of it. Um, we seem to, in, in industry, they think in terms of how these imports and exports influence the economy. In biology, we call this biogeochemistry. And this is why our planet is very different from all the other planets because the living side of, these two, of this two box model keeps the earth in a chemical disequilibrium and allows us to have things like oxygen in the atmosphere. At the same time, these ecosystems are processing energy according to the laws of thermodynamics. We see high grade energy coming into the system. We see the metabolism that we would think of as community metabolism, production, consumption, decomposition, and then a lower grade of energy leaves the system. So energy flows through systems while the um, particulate parts, essentially the elements, can recycle. And the greatest example of this is in the symbiosis between corals and their zooxanthellae. So we have the animal that acts like a wall of mouths and traps nutrients and it catching zooplankton. <clears throat> its microbiome helps quite a bit and probably manufacturing all kinds of interesting um, vitamins and other molecules. And the algae sit there and chow down on photons. And in doing so, the two collaborate in polytrophy and that results in enhanced growth of the colony, both in its tissue and its calcification. Another process that you'll see very common and sort of universal in ecology is that life will expand to fill the space into which it can. This is Vernadsky's theory of the biosphere from 1926. And so what we see is um, over this course of however many 
days, weeks, months, years, depending on the ecosystem. We go from early succession through to mid and late succession. And we see an enhancement in the amount of biomass present. At that same time, through this process, we see respiration steadily increasing and in tracking biomass. We also see photosynthesis peaking in mid succession and then winnowing down as this process, as this community fills up. So it's sort of like a large corporation. Uh, it becomes very productive when it's young. And then as it gets older and older and older, the amount of energy being used to run the system increases. And so the photosynthesis to respiration ratio of older systems is very small. As a matter of fact, um, Eugene Odom suggested that as a consequence of this, net community production or yield, what you can remove from a community, is large in young nature and small or next to zero in mature communities. And this is really critical when we come to reefs. So we can line all of these various communities up in a graph of community production versus respiration. And we can see that they all basically line up on this P to R ratio of one. Actually, they're all slightly on the, on the positive side of that with a P to R ratio of slightly more than one. And that's what they use to run themselves. There is no real energy left over in any mature system. They use all that energy to keep themselves operating. So let's sit back for a second and look at this. We have a system that has gone through its successional stage and it's in relatively some sort of ecosystem stability or steady state. Um, it's close to its carrying capacity. We see the inputs and the outputs are relatively constant. This is all superimposed on the energy of the system and the system was in some sort of eco ecosystem homeostasis. In regulated communities, it's at this point that the biological forcing functions predominate. Competition, predation, herbivory, these density dependent interactions are what drives and controls the community structure. And it gives rise to the idea of the red queen hypothesis, the biological arms race. And here's a perfect example of that. This is um, basically from Judy Lang and, and, and her legacy of watching corals overgrow one another. And here in the um, Dampier Straits of Raja Ampat, we can see all of this happening as different species of acropolis are overgrowing each other. So think of a reef as an ecosystem, not a resource. The community is an emergent property of all the interactions of all the organisms there, and all those parts are needed for its sustainability. There is no extra stuff. There is no um, productivity that can be really harvested out of this system without influencing the system. Now, in the same time we've seen coral monitoring increase and explode throughout the world, we've also seen scuba diving explode throughout the world. And this is just a number of PADI certificates issued on an annual basis, um, and we're upwards of around 800,000 now. So from sort of a small group of people that were banded together in small groups like the British Subaqua Club, we now have a raging business that is a multi-billion dollar business going around the world. And you can think in terms of diving tourism supporting sustainable economies. And, and we talk a lot about that. And when you think about that, people are bundled into what I would call lodging units. If they go and they stay on land, they're in a homestay or a resort or villages or visiting a, a friend. And if they happen to be in a mobile floating um, lodging unit, they're on a yacht or a homestay um, liveaboard or something like that. So we have people living in places and moving around or being stationary. When these people come to these environments, they um, mostly live at a higher lifestyle. So they would like a Western infrastructure in this remote location. They've come to do some bucket list diving. They want to see the sharks or the mantas or the turtles um, or the big fish, but they'd like to have modern safe diving. They'd like to have good guides. They want to be comfortable. They want to have wonderful move, uh, meals, including high protein seafoods. Um, they want alcoholic drinks, air conditioning. They want the full Monty because they're on vacation. And this requires a significant supply chain infrastructure, tremendous amount of capital investment to make this work. And it generates a tremendous amount of human nutrient and operational waste. So the very adaptations that enable corals to thrive in these environments are gonna make them vulnerable to the presence of humans. And the unintended consequence of tourism is to change the local ecology. 
we increase the um, runoff, we increase the amount of sewage, we increase the chemicals, we increase the physical damage, overfishing. We basically disrupt the local ecology. And you can break human impacts into three things. We can take, break, or pollute. It's very simple. We built this model a long time ago um, to try to understand some of this and to, and to visualize it. And I'm not gonna go into it right now because it's here, you can look at it later, but it basically tries to pick apart what people do. And you can roughly lump these into taking stuff, breaking stuff, or polluting stuff. So let's consider the hypothetical human impacts. And as G. Evelyn Hutchinson used to talk, talk about, he'd say, environmental degradation is like being nibbled together, nibbled to death by ducks. So let's look at the impact of different kinds of ducks or people. A local might take a small amount, break some, pollute some, and have a total of say 60. Whereas a scientist might take a little more and break a little more and pollute a little more and have a some total of 80. Um, and the underwater photographer, because they like to lie on the bottom and photograph stuff and they think they paid for this, they might break a little more. So anyway, we could theoretically at least put people into these um, categories. And so if we think about the growth rate of a population as being exponential and then density dependence added to that, we bring it down to logistic growth, and then we add another term. And that term is the, the sum of the impact of all these different kinds of tourists and people that are in that environment. And we could think of that as the net human impact sum. And that would be the sum of all the takes and breaks and pollutions from all the different human types and the sum of all of that. And if we took that and added it back into our logistic equation, it becomes a factor that essentially reduces the carrying capacity of the system. And so what it's going to do is it's gonna decrease the carrying capacity as this system moves through time. Now, when we get into a situation where we have a relatively remote area that gets a huge influx in, in tourism, because now what we're going to do is instead of fish bombing and shark finning, we're gonna have sustainable tourism. We see this explosive growth in visitors to the area. And it's also followed by an explosive growth of people to service that industry. And we now have, um, instead of three or four liverboards, we have about 180. And instead of five or six homestays, we have 100 we see this exponential increase in tourism. And just to give you one example of that, if we think about increasing human nutrients, we think of a, a human as, as a day of activity, the human as a poop day, we can see that in 2000 in the Dampier Straits, we had about 9.7 million poop days, all the residents, all the visitors. Now, 18 years later, we're up to about 26 million poop days a year. It's a 375, 374, percent increase in the amount of human waste going into that system. And so the reefs become nutrient sinks because they're starved for nutrients. They'll grab at anything. It's said that nitrogen is like crack cocaine for zooxanthellae. And the result is an explosion of degradation on the reef. For example, we see diseases um, downstream from these sources of pollution that five, 10 years ago, nobody ever even saw or had heard of. So here we are troubled and, and worried about the global changes that we see happening, mostly from global warming, but we also realize that we have to treat the resiliency of these systems and we wanna to move towards having reefs that are locally more resilient. So hopefully they can withstand these global pressures that come along. So I would suggest to you that we step back for a second and think about this idea of sustainability. What we'd like to do is keep the reef in its steady state equilibrium, its so-called balance of nature. We need to do that by realizing that the reef first and foremost has to obey the laws of nature. We can integrate people into that nature being clever. We have to manage the people, not reefs. We can support communities and have sustainable tourism if we do it the right way. And in some respects, we have to think of each and every tourist as one of these little COVID creatures that's running around the planet and infecting people. And what we really want to do then is to manage the people as though they were a pandemic 
on the reef. So with that, I'd like to close and say, I'm, I'm really appreciative that all you people are here. I think this is great. Um, and thanks for listening. And I'll be happy to address any questions now or later. Thanks. Are we there? Thanks, Phil. Um, Judy will take us through the Q&A and she will um, read the questions you, you all were posing in the Q&A and then the plenary speakers will um, answer them for you. Well, Francisca, all the questions in the Q&A are technical ones to you and I about from people who are having trouble uh, with their with their reception. So I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to go back to a question that came up for Esther, Dr. Peters in the chat from somebody who perhaps wasn't uh, logged on at the beginning and didn't know it was supposed to go in the Q&A. And that is, um, do you have any advice or information regarding choral histology procedures? additional to the wonderful book you already published, or if there are any workshops planned similar to the choral histopathology workshop held in 2005. So here's the next generation desiring to join you in the, in the um, ever more exciting, expanding field of histopathology. Would you care to answer? Yes, and I am so glad to hear that people are um, interested and want to learn more. And we're trying to get more information out um, with some papers published as well as offering um, other opportunities uh, for training. Of course, in this time of the pandemic that we're all having to shift to online things, uh, we have realized that a project that was started by um, uh, Dr. Cheryl Woodley at NOAA uh, a few years ago uh, to develop a coral virtual microscopy system uh, is going to be key to providing additional training. And uh, for that, um, we, uh, she collected a lot of slides. They have been digitized. They have been um, uh, added to the archives at NOAA, and they have also now uh, been um, uh, put together by a graduate student of mine into a system uh, that is using open source software so that we hope that uh, more people will be able to study them and learn more about how to interpret uh, tissue sections. And that includes that we are going to um, uh, provide additional scans of uh, the tissues from the stony coral tissue loss disease samples uh, that uh, we hope to start working on shortly and add those to the collection as well. Thus, uh, we will have that part ready. And it has also been in the um, uh, plans uh, that I would uh, provide uh, course development working around this um, uh, virtual microscopy system. I'm afraid I'm probably going to have to um, retire to do this, but, but maybe I will do it next summer. I don't know. But, but we will uh, be trying to offer more training opportunities for people using this virtual microscopy system. Uh, that um, the state of Florida uh, is going to be funding uh, the um, hosting of it and we'll be sending out information on Coral List uh, as those plans develop. Thank you. So I do have another question here, which is that uh, this is from somebody who has seen corals with stony coral tissue loss disease and remarks that they are 
very similar to corals with some very virulent types of white plague disease. And is there any histopathological evidence or molecular evidence as to whether or not they're the same or different? And of course, Jen can also contribute to that answer. Well, um, we still don't know at the moment, but I, I, we have been working on this uh, question. Uh, I get received slides from one of my former graduate students who had uh, taken tissue samples for a study of white plague disease in the um, uh, mid 2000s. And uh, we, I'm going to be looking, I started looking at these slides to try to discern if there are any differences. Um, and the slides were never looked at at that time because he was busy working on the molecular microbiology. And so we then hope uh, we have gotten him uh, added into the uh, microbiology um, work group uh, that uh, is then convened to study um, the uh, uh, biosystem bioinformatics coming out of the uh, um, uh, samples uh, for, for molecular analysis. And hopefully we'll have a better uh, answer uh, about that by the end of the year. So yes, we still do not know at this time because uh, no one else really studied uh, the, the histology uh, of the white plague. Um, so, so we don't know but we will hopefully find out. All right, and here is another question for you. Uh, at the end of the talk, Jen mentioned four very um, high-tech sounding approaches to the study of coral histopathology. And, and, and it's realized that this is all work in progress and was slowed by the uh, recent shutdown due to the COVID-19. All these graduate students, I guess, have not been in their labs for several months. But at the moment, which one do you think shows the greatest promise and why? And well, of course, I, uh, I don't know who wants to answer that. Well, I would just say from my perspective, uh, they, they all have great promise. And uh, there are several of us uh, who are working on stony coral tissue loss disease uh, research who are using these combinations. And so uh, I, I think they all show great promise. They, of course, are being used to study human diseases and veterinary diseases. And we, we have to move in this direction to study the coral diseases as well. Jen, do you have anything? Sure. What came to mind is the recent pandemic, of course, it was the head of NIH that said they have, I think, four vaccines in development. And so you have, to, you know, we're, we're trying diversity approaches and and some of them are also dependent or integrated uh, with one another. So we're hoping that um, they'll provide more insight into the disease. And um, again, in trying different methodologies, seeing which might yield the most useful information. Thank you, Jen. Uh, that brought to mind the suggestion that was made uh, earlier this year in the Florida Disease Advisory Committee meeting by someone that if the um, if the uh, probiotic approach to discovering what can stop the stony coral tissue loss disease uh, is successful, does can you work backwards to identify the causative agent and of that is causing that is responding to the antibiotic that the probiotic is producing and that late in the disease if I can make it double barrel um, are you even confident that that's what caused the coral to get sick in the first place well, it, like any antibiotic, it depends on the specificity. Some are what's called broad spectrum. So they kill a number of different types of microorganisms and some are more specific. Um, so it would be dependent on that, but we're hoping with some of these more specific methods, we could, you know, and, and as I mentioned, it's 
we have to move away from this idea that it's a single pathogen. It could be very likely that it is uh, multiple types of microorganisms or maybe some other external environmental factor that's causing programmed cell death in the corals. We don't know that yet. That's why we're trying to hit it from all these different angles. And there are many, many scientists using many different tools to, to look at this question. Um, I'm trying to go back to the second part of your question. So you wanted to know if you'd be able to backtrack. Um, so I think that would be hard to answer without more specific information, but um, certainly probiotics is yet another one of the tools in the toolbox that are being used in addition to other methodology to try to, to prevent the spread or um, colony mortality. So, um, and there's a lot of promise they've seen a, a lot of success with it. So I think it's, it's hopeful, um, but we still have not identified the pathogen and, and um, you know, if probiotics works, that's great. It's probably still important. We want, we would like to know the cause of this disease that we can take preventative measures in the future for now. Even. Well, thank you very much, Esther and Jennifer. I now have a few questions for Phil, who seems to have disappeared from <laughs> his background. Are you still there, Phil? Oh yeah, I'm here. Oh, He's you're here. Now. He's hiding. Okay. Um, I've had a question come in asking, how can you practically reduce the overfishing that you mentioned in that slide as being one of the factors um, adversely affecting coral reefs without unfairly penalizing the fishermen who are more easily displaced from their traditional occupations than are the um, the more affluent capitalists and other financiers who are putting in the money for the resorts? So in, in many places um, where I've worked in, in Indonesia, the fishermen become the people that drive tourists around in their boats. And so they, they have a role to play. And then the fishermen actually become very, um, very protective of the reef because they realize that their income is tied to the reef. So what you want to do is you want to get the locals tied to that, that income. Um, the other aspect is what we've seen is already the pressures that are coming onto reefs are sort of overbearing. So if you really want to have a reef, um, you have to back off from those fishing pressures. What they've done in Raja Ampat, which I think is really clever, um, at, at some resorts, they will buy fish from the fishermen, but only if they're pelagic fish, they won't buy reef fish. And there's a general moratorium on reef fish. Although if you go to the local market, you'll find reef fish. Um, you know, reefs happen to be relatively productive, even though most of that really runs the system, but they can be drawn down quite a bit. The idea of marine protected areas and fishing places, you have some fishing spots, some spots that aren't fishing. I think the locals in many places are realizing that a fish in the ocean is worth more to show to people than it is to catch and eat. But then you have a shift in the diet of the people that live there. Um, you know, nobody has a right to go out and, and kill all the fish. A lot of my friends go out and go fishing and I say, hey, some of those are my fish. It's the commons, right? So leave some of them in the ocean. I'd like to leave my fish there instead of catching all of them. Um, although most fishermen will like to catch the last fish in the sea. So I think in some respects, what you have to do is limit the size of development. There has to be some control on this. If we just have raw capitalism, like what we're seeing in places like, like parts of Indonesia now, where there's this explosion of, of live aboard vessels and explosion of homestays and resorts, sure, it's just gonna drive the system into oblivion and then the economy will disappear. So if we wanna make a real truly sustainable system, we have to go back to the laws of nature and obey the laws of nature. It's just like people now, this whole political thing about face masks. Oh, I don't want to wear a face mask. Oh, yeah, I want to wear a face mask. Oh, I don't want to wear a face mask. Oh, I do want to wear No, I don't. It's a political thing. It's not. The virus doesn't care. The virus is just biology. Same thing with the reef. If we want to have reefs, we have to obey the biology, the principles of biology. Well, thank you. That was... That was a very uh, complete answer. Um, I have to admit that I, the places that I know of in the Caribbean where the fishermen are definitely helping with the sustainable tourism or just the tourism or even just the diving science um, industry, um, the amount of employment for, for, for them in those sectors doesn't equal to the number of fishermen who are 
who were previously fishing and there's still a lot of excessive um, catching going on. So I'm- Yeah, yeah I would agree with you. Um, in all probability, we have 7 billion people on the planet, which is probably about four times more than we need. And, um, and so we have overpopulation and the overpopulation spills into the rape of ecosystems. Um, I don't know a single ecosystem that doesn't really have some sort of pandemic disease problem on land. We have the frogs, we have the bees, we have the birds, we have the sea otters, everything is being diseased. Everything is being overhunted. It's just being overrun by people. If we would like to somehow work on that and maybe COVID is a time at which we can begin to get our priorities straight and begin to think about how can we lower the human population size over the next three or four generations. And the way to do that is to increase generation size and let it slowly work its way down. And there are lots of ways that we can do that. Or we can just sort of let it hang and slide and do what it's going to do and it will crash eventually at some point. And that'll be the hard way down. Okay, Phil, we have, a, we have time for one more good question and I'm going to pull it from the chat from Tatiana Becker. Uh, who says in Aruba, we have recently set up a study to monitor the effects of the presence of tourists on nearshore habitats, as we expect that tourist numbers will not immediately return back to normal after COVID-19. So there will be a gradual increase in disturbance with gradual increase in tourist numbers. And thus the disturbances on fish and sensitive species is expected to be lower. I am wondering if scientists and graduates on other Caribbean islands, and I wouldn't say why limit it to the Caribbean, would like to join us in our efforts to see whether similar patterns will be observed regarding fish and sensitive species like mega herbivores in nearshore habitats. And I know you can address that question. Yeah, um, you know, we're, we're actually doing this in Raja Ampat. Um, we have the observations of the fish, but there's not enough gasoline. Gas is so expensive, it's hard to go it's hard to actually go out there. So we're looking at remote ways of doing that. But we're also sampling algae for um, stable isotope analysis. Because if the people disappear and the nitrogen signal disappears, we should see that in the integration of that signal into the um, reef organisms. So I would recommend that everybody go out. I know that in Hanama Bay, for example, Hawaii, they're doing some studies now. I would recommend that everybody that can get out, get out and start to make observations on some aspect of the reef. And then when the tourists come back, try to really critically see what the tourists are doing. You know, Try to individually trace tourists, see what they do, see how they behave, try to get an idea of what kind of caring capacity can there be. In Indonesia, they realized there are too many people going to Komodo Island, so they increased the price of a ticket to $1,000. Um, that way only the rich people can go. But maybe like up in uh, the High Sierras where they have trails, there's a lottery. So the state of California will have a lottery that allows so many people to go to those areas. So maybe we can do something like that. We can begin to try to understand what this carrying capacity should be or could be and gradually work our ways back to that. Well, if we don't have any more questions, we are right on the nose at four o'clock. So I'm going to say thank you so very much to our three speakers today and to our sponsors. And that part of the screen has disappeared. So I will just have to read them to you. I can find them. We had, we had funding for the, um, for the remote meetings from, the, from, from, ah, from the Company of Biologists. I knew it was a strange name and I could see company down there on the top of that slide, but not the base. Cause they uh, sponsored and made the Zoom meeting possible. And then TC there, Trade Wind Colors, sponsored the gifts for the plenary speakers and other trivia. So thank you to speakers and thank you to our sponsors. And I'm so glad you're still looking happy. And then the next slide will tell us what's happening. 
now and tomorrow. So there's networking, which I think starts at 4.15 and there will be technical ad advances in reef studies talk session tomorrow at, and it's not coming up here, is that 1.45 to 2.45, Francisca? The Reef Bank Project and the Integrative Approach to on the Sustainable Prospection of Marine Natural Products, Advanced Technical Diving for Deep Reef Exploration, and Customized Medicine for Corals. And then at three to four, we will have, or maybe that's from one to 245. Yeah, and then one to 245 and then three to four. And then three to four. That's not coming up here. Is it coming up on other people's screen? The time? Anyway, management and conservation plenary talks. Um, different topics, different uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. David Gill will be evaluating the impacts of coral reef management. Um, and Dr. Brigitte Van Tussenbroek will talk about the impact of the Sargassum brown tides on Mexican Caribbean coast. Uh, David's talk is more globally focused and Brigetta is addressing a really serious uh, environmental problem in the Caribbean at the moment. So thank you very much for attending and uh, stay tuned for the networking session if you signed up for that. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. That was great. You're welcome.